Well, good morning to everybody. First of all, I would like to thank you, Steel Orbis, for the invitation to the current meeting and for having the opportunity to share with you my personal understanding about the current situation of the European steel market. Um, I'm Tommaso Sandrini, I'm the president of Assofermet Acciai, that is the National Association of Steel Distributors, of steel distributors and Steel Service Centers in Italy. Um, I would like to start with a couple of sentences just in order to set the, 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 my, my perspective of the day. Uh, it was a famous Prussian uh, general, Karl von Clausewitz, that he says, war is merely the continuation of politics by other means. War is an act of force to compel our enemy to do our will. Uh, this is just to introduce you the perspective I would like to follow in the presentation. So the competition among nations and how conflicts and wars are a part of our lives, even though the Europeans have, um, have, um, have almost rejected the concept of, of war, considering it as something that we should avoid at any cost. And when we talk about competition among nations, we should consider that uh, they are basically a mean for transferring political sovereignty are from transferring economic and human resources. So basically these outcomes can be considered as goals, as goals both for wars and conflicts. And this is just to bring you to the main messages I would like to share with you today. Uh, in order to get a proper understanding of the current scenario of the likely evolution of the global trade and therefore the impacts on the steel market, we need to change the perspective of the analysis. Geopolitics and not economy is driving the moves of the main actors. Uh, in many cases, we are just looking through the economic lens uh, to the events that are reshaping our steel business. Uh, we should change the perspective. The global trade system and therefore the global steel market are, are experiencing a deep revolution, so the deglobalization and basically the dismantlement of the WTO. This is what is happening in front of us, even though many people are somehow rejecting the concept of dismantling the WTO. Uh, the European Union is clearly unfit to manage the new scenario and will not drive the change. We will remain a move taker. The decision will be taken by, I mean, elsewhere, namely the US and China, those are the main actors who will reshape our business environment. And from my point of view, the trade war and protectionism will be the new normal and the transition will be quite, quite chaotic. So basically there are big discontinuities in front of us and they will reshape our business environment. Uh, from my point of view, the U.S. are the protagonists of that change. So in order to understand uh, the reasons behind that, we need to look at their perspective. And this is how the U.S. see the world. Basically, it's, all the world is their backyard. They are controlling all the main uh, oceans, trade routes, continents, also, also through a military presence, basically worldwide. And uh, uh, I mean, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the, the U.S. have remained the only great power and they have created a sound system of, con of power based on the control of the main sort of national institution, IMF, World Bank, WTO, United Nations, but also based on the military control of the main trade routes. They were basically granting and securing an economical and political system in which no one but the U.S. have to take care of. Now that system is over and the dismantlement of the WTO is one of the main evidence of that. The WTO has been dismantled by, by the US uh, for two main reasons. On one side, it is not effective anymore in achieving its original goals, westernizing other countries. I mean, our, every one of us is watching American movies, series. Uh, there is a cultural uh, diffusion of, uh, of America worldwide. On the other side, uh, the second and more relevant issue is that they have to limit the ambition and the growth of China as a great power, also accepting the negative effects on, on, the, on their economy. So the reasons why they are doing this are exclusively geopolitical, not economical. At the same time, the European Union is somehow accepting, not driving the, main outcome, the same outcomes, because the, uh, and the reason why are totally different. They are only economic decision it's, a, it's only an economic perspective that is driving the European institution, and the reason why is that the European people are not willing anymore to accept the social cost of globalization. Uh, and the consequences are significant because the deglobalization will proceed, it will continue for a while. All the bilateral negotiation will replace the typical multilateral trade agreements that we have seen under the WTO umbrella. Uh, what Mr. Trump is doing on a daily basis is pretty clear to everybody. He's negotiating face-to-face -face with single countries, 
achieving much more than what he, he could achieve uh, in, a, in, a, in a wider negotiation table. Uh, the trade war will continue, this is quite important, not as a goal for rebalancing the trade deficit of the US, but as a mean for threatening the Chinese and German's economic model. I mean, the China is clearly the growing power. They are, I mean, they deserve a leading role in the global scenario, that's my point of view. They will achieve this. They are still, they still lag behind the US from many point of view. I mean, economy is not the only dimension we should use in order to analyze the strategic position of the US and China, but China is really improving a lot on all, on all the dimensions. Uh, but the trade deficit is not the, the reason why the US started the trade war. The issue is specifically geopolitical. This brings a significant uh, revaluation of the country risk. The country risk has almost been neglected during the period of the Pax Americana. Uh, it will impact significantly and it will reduce significantly the amount of cross-border investments. It will be not that easy to invest in other emerging countries because we will not know in the future what will be the set of rules that will uh, uh, rule and govern the trade among, co uh, among countries, the opportunities and how the system will behave. Uh, the geopolitical friction will limit significantly the scope of the global trade and markets will become more regional. And even though the Europeans have, once, have al almost rejected the concept of conflicts, uh, I think that the world have, has never been as competitive as it is today and the competition will be deployed at very different levels. Economic, of course, regulatory, fiscal, cyber competition. So we have a significant discontinuities in front of us. Things are changes are changing and uh, uh, we should be aware of this. When we look at the steel, uh, at the steel market, well, the situation is not, is not easier. In the meaning that in the short term, we have uh, an economic downturn that is involving all the major economies, but also most of the emerging markets. Uh, I think that in the long term, so we, we could have a new investment and opportunities that could arise, but they will create winners and losers. So they will add they will be disruptive. If, if we think about uh, immobility, sharing economy, green energy, the green energy revolution, the digital revolution, all these elements will reshape our societies and our business environment, so they are adding uh, disruption in our economic system. The European steel demand is experiencing a global, and from my point of view, quite long-lasting negative trends. Uh, namely, the automotive is impacting a lot and mills are clearly under pressure from a, cost, from a margin point of view. Even though there are significant differences among the, uh, the different businesses of the end users, or of the still consuming businesses. The revision of the safeguard system will not impact significantly the current scenario. It's, it's, it's quite a marginal event from my point of view. Uh, the import, despite all the trade defense measures, will remain quite stable, quite relevant into the European market, and Turkey will remain a privileged part partner for the European Union as well. <clears throat> then if we go deeper into the Italian situation, we can see that from my point of view, the perception is more negative than the, than the reality. Uh, in the meaning that uh, I, th I see basically two very different scenarios. On one side, the automotive and white goods. On the other side, the general industry. In the automotive and white goods, we have a very negative uh, uh, reduction of the, of the local demand. Uh, where some structural changes are affecting in the long run the consumption of steel. The immobility for the automotive, the very significant delocalization for the white goods. In 2019, the demand has been much lower than last year. Also, the forecast for 2020 is evenly more negative. Uh, but the main issue is that we cannot expect any permanent recovery unless we have a sort of consolidation of the, of the underlying technology. For the, for the engine part of the car, and a stable regulatory environment. And both those conditions are far away from being achieved at the moment. On the other side, there is the general industries, uh, where so far, I mean, in the year to date, the shipped volumes are almost in line with the date of last year. So basically, okay, they are fine. Uh, even though there are significant changes in the, per in the purchasing attitude. There is a permanent shortening of the, of, of the order books in all the value chain, so shorter delivery times. There are several negotiations that have, uh, uh, instead of one single agreement, so it's putting pressure on the seller and is uh, uh, bringing the bargaining power versus the buyer. 
so basically the main issue is from my point of view a lack of confidence in the business environment and that is, that is bringing the appearing demand to be much lower than the real demand. At the same time, well, I've seen many charts before regarding the global scenario, so I will be very, very, very short on this. Uh, just uh, three very brief comments. Uh, China is uh, more and more leading the scenario with, with a quota significantly above 50% of the total production worldwide. So this is an element we should uh, uh, take into account, of course, ev everyone knows it, but namely, uh, as the former speaker said, uh, most of the production in China is for the internal demand. The, the second element is that uh, all the countries that traditionally were net importers worldwide are building new capacity and they are increasing the production. It means that in the future, export will be more and more a challenging task. It will be not, not easy at all to export in other countries since if they are big markets from the steel demand point of view, they will build capacity or they are really building capacity. Think to Vietnam, Iran, Indonesia. And uh, uh, the last comment is that uh, the uh, recent cut, again, the former speaker was commenting on it, of the, let's say, uh, low, um, I mean, high polluting and the low efficiency production plants in China with a significant reduction that has taken place in 2015 and 16 has brought the marginal, the, the, the curve of the, of, the, of, of the marginal producer to be much more flat. It means that the supply curve is extremely rigid. It means that we have an increase in volatility. I mean, the volatility will be much bigger than, than before in the future. So basically, these elements together can create a sort of per perfect storm because on one side, we have a very high production in the Far East countries, namely China, that is supporting basically the raw material prices. Raw materials are extremely expensive today compared to the steel prices. But at the same time in Europe, we have a weak demand that is somehow squeezing down the, mar the prices and therefore the margins. So the combination of those two elements is really critic for the European for the European market nowadays. My personal understanding is that we, we can have two possible outcomes. Either on one side we could have a sudden increase of the prices in the European steel market, even though an ephemeral one. I would expect a, a, after a short period of time a subsequent fall of the prices as well, so basically an increase in volatility. On the other side, we could have, and I do not think it will happen, a significant cut of the production in the Far East. It could bring down the raw material prices and therefore it will push down also the steel prices. Whatever the outcomes, in any case, I expect some volatility to come in the market. Uh, going deeper into the European market, if we look to what has happened over the last uh, several years, we can see that uh, Things have changed a lot in the European market, but the, main, but the main comment I would like to share with you is that so far, if I have to make a comment on the safeguard system, it has been effective in reducing the import into the European Union. The blue curve is the import within the European Union coming from whatever. Uh, it went down by 8% in the first uh, uh, eight, uh, nine months of, last year, of this year compared to the nine, the nine months of, four the, uh, of, the, of the former years. Uh, the issue is that we have become a, neg a, a net importer from being a net exporter up until 2015. Uh, but the issue and the question that normally is not raised in any, in any, in any conference is that at, at the same time, we have a continuous decline of the European export. So and a question we should give an answer to is why the European still is becoming less competitive in the global scenario? This is, a, a, I mean, half of the, of the net imbalance is due to the reduction in the export. Of course, the import is playing a leading role. My perception is that in the recent five years, uh, European production didn't follow the increase in the demand, therefore we had to buy elsewhere. But so far, just to make a comment on the safeguard, it, it has been effective. If we look at the, at the situation involving Turkey, well, many speakers this morning have already commented the chart, but I would like just to share one comment. Uh, Turkey had a significant increase uh, in uh, 2018 and 19, the first eight months, uh, but basically the Turkey has taken the place of other countries that, that left the European Union in terms of import, in terms of supplying to the European market. 
And of course, we should also split. Those are uh, the structural changes in the scenario from the contingency events. I mean, we have seen how the demand has locally collapsed in Turkey, and therefore, of course, you can have this kind of, this kind of uh, let's say, flows coming from such a neighbor country to the, to the European market. Uh, very few words on the revision of the safeguard system, then if anyone wants, we can go deeper into that. Globally, we have f five areas of changes that the European Commission has decided to apply starting from October the 1st. Uh, the first one is the reduction of the relaxation from 5 to 3 percent, with an effect that, from my point of view, will be almost negligible, very limited, due to the fact that the um, the current weak demand in the European market uh, is not creating pressure on the increase of the global quota. The second one is more relevant, of course, uh, is, the, is, is involving the HRC and uh, a limit of 30% per country of the quarterly quota has been set starting from October the 1st. It means that we have a uh, round about 8 million tons uh, is the yearly quota of HRC. It means uh, 2 million tons per quarter. Uh, every country cannot exceed 0 0.6 million tons of import into the European Union. With the system of, uh, uh, let's say, reproposing on the following quarter the amount not being used in the former one. So if in one quarter you use only 1 million tons of quota, the remaining 1 million is available in the next quarter. So in that case, uh, the 30% uh, can bring to a 0 0.9 million tons of available quota per every single country. Again, in the current situation in which there is a significant number of countries that, that, that are offering into the European market, the situation is not creating any uh, limitation in, in importing materials since uh, Turkey, Korea, Japan, Taiwan, Russia, Egypt are all active in the European market. But if we had a situation of the end of last year in which Turkey was playing a leading role in the European market, then it would be a totally different situation. The third uh, one is the most relevant one and the most tricky one, in the meaning that for the ODIP galvanized coils, the 4A and 4B groups have, been, uh, have received new rules that are aiming at securing the automotive supply. Uh, just skipping all the detail of the regulation, we should comment that one of the main side effects of that has been that the, now we can buy Chinese ODIP, ODIP, ODIP galvanized material, not chemically passivated, within the 4A group. It means that we have an additional quota available of around about 2 million tons for the ABG coming from China. So this is a significant change, and we will see how the situation will evolve. But this is, uh, um, let's say, a revision that goes in the other direction with respect to the former two. Four and five are less relevant from my point of view. Uh, one general comment, how can we work in an environment in which rules are changing so rapidly and so often? It's unacceptable to have a set of rules that uh, is uh, under a systematic activity of revision from the European institution. As an operator, I can tell you that it's very hard to work, to take decisions, to establish long-lasting relationship also with suppliers. One general comment on Turkey. Uh, from my point of view, Turkey will remain a privilege, will maintain a privileged relationship with the European Union, in the meaning that the Turkish economy is much more integrated with the European Union than what is commonly perceived. The number of companies European that are operating in Turkey and vice versa is huge. The, the interrelation is extremely high. Second point is that the close relationship between Turkey and Germany will create internal support in any confrontation with the European Union. We cannot forget this. It is pretty clear to everybody. Uh, I mean, Germany is the leading country in Europe, and tight relationship with it, between Turkey and Germany are supporting Turkey. Number three is that the recent friction with the US, basically the Russian S-400 anti-aircraft missiles and the conflict in Syria. So despite those events, Turkey will remain a key ally of the US and of the European Union in the area. Even though Turkey will always play a uh, uh, on the two table games with Russia and the US. I mean, your geography is your blessing and your course. Uh, you are the entry door for the Mediterranean for Russia, and uh, you have to manage the relationship with such an important uh, country. Uh, but at the same time, you are an ally of the US and a member of the NATO system. So globally, the position of Turkey will be, of course, very complicated in the future, but it will remain a key ally from my point of view. 
last but not least, uh, Turkey is playing a leading role in managing the migration phenomenon into the European Union, and we, we cannot forget this. It, it, uh, it creates a significant implication for the European governments. And, that, and then, uh, just as a, as a buyer, I would like to spend just a few words on the perception that I have, I mean, as a buyer of Turkish materials. A uh, few advices. I mean, uh, quality-wise, the HRC from Turkey stands below the level of many Europeans and, and import mills, India, Korea, Taiwan, and Japan. And this is a problem because in many cases it's forcing the seller to give discounts with respect to other sources. So it's an opportunity that you have. Cold roll and galvanize are better positioned even though mainly focused on commodity grades. Second is that you need a timely response and reaction to the market request. You should be very quick. The third is that managing claims is the best way for securing the relationship with customers. I mean, globally, my perception is that Turkey is so close to Europe. We have seen in the former presentation this morning how the, in the period of reduction of the, on the local demand, uh, Europe has been an opportunity for exporting material for the Turkish producer. Consider Europe as a second domestic market and therefore stick tightly to it, avoiding an eat and run approach. I mean, we are much closer than we normally perceive and what we say. Uh, we should work together and we should talk a lot. That's my, that's my point of view. And then one very last chart that I added yesterday evening uh, due to the situation on the Italian market regarding ILVA. Uh, I know, I mean, everyone I mean, knows about what, I mean, some information about what, what is happening since uh, Monday, so two days ago. ArcelorMittal has withdrawn uh, from the lease and purchase agreement with the Italian government. So in 30 days, ILVA will be under the control of the commissioners and will operate as an independent company starting from December the, from December the 4th. The idling of blast furnace number two has already been started. So it's already a reduction, an additional reduction of the very low production in, in Taranto. And today, now, in uh, 12, uh, half past 12, the uh, ArcelorMittal representative are meeting the Italian government to discuss locally the situation. So uh, whatever the final outcome, the recent events of ILVA will be disruptive in the Italian steel market. That's my perception. My very personal idea is that the decision of ArcelorMittal is uh, a definitive one. It's not a negotiation approach in order to get, uh, let's say, better, better condition from the Italian government. My perception is that they are gone. It's over. And uh, considering the level of opposition and the level of uh, hostility that the domestic institution I've always had over, over, over the last uh, seven years with, with, respect to ILVA, with respect to ILVA, I do not expect any, any positive um, final solution for the, for the plant in Taranto. So we are quite concerned, Sign significant discontinuities will come, even though the situation is still uh, very rapidly evolving.